Well, thanks for having me. Uh, it's been quite a while since I've been at a mug meeting. Not, never in this facility, not since the IBM building days. Um, lots of uh, familiar faces here, it's great to see. How many people are uh, out still supporting mug? It's awesome, really awesome. All right, I don't wanna bore you too much with slides, but I do need to set the table a little bit. Uh, so I'll go the, through these pretty quick. Um, just to sort of note up front, uh, this is really kind of from a business perspective. It's not really, you know, Azure's not really designed for hobbyists, that kind of thing. But hopefully even if you're just, you know, hobbyist around Linux, you're still going to learn something interesting um, regarding, you know, what, what Linux is all about and what Azure is all about specifically. So, again, I'm going to go through these a little bit quick. But if you think about the computing industry, um, there are a lot of par parallels in every other industry, right? So, back in the day, if you wanted to bake a loaf of bread, I'll go through these fast, I'll build this out quick. If you wanted to bake a lo loaf of bread, right, you had to do everything yourself. You had to generate the power, grind the flour, blah, 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 you get the point. At the end of the day, you could sell your loaf of bread if you were a baker, but you had to know a lot of other things in order to make that happen. But as, you know, power became a little more available, you didn't have to do all of this yourself, right? But in the early days, there were a lot of different providers, a lot of different standards. There was still, you know, a complicated mash of technology required uh, in order, you know, to get power and energy delivered to your prem. To what we look at today is I really don't know, need to know anything other than I recognize if I see this pattern, I can take the plug and plug it in there and it's gonna work for me. I don't even need to know, you know, what voltage it is, anything. Right, so that's what we want to get to when we're talking about computing. And we're slowly going down that path. And that's really what the cloud is all about, is taking away the complexity. So you can think about if you're doing it fully on-prem. It's just sort of a stack here of things that you kind of have to be aware of, or at least be taken care of if you're doing everything yourself on-prem. So it's a fairly complex stack. You, you know, and back in, you know, let's say 20 years ago, you know, it was pretty, I will say simpler to be the computer guy or the IT guy for a company, right? There wasn't a crazy number of different things to consider. Um, but these days, you know, it's almost like the medical prof profession as well, if you want to draw, you know, another analogy. You know, early days of the medical profession, there was, you know, basically a GP. And if you had a problem, you went to him and he did his best. You know, but there weren't a thousand specialists. Now, you go see a GP and he refers you to somebody else who might refer to you to an even more dedicated specialist, right? As the, as the technology, you know, as the knowledge base around the profession has expanded exponentially, you've got more and more dedicated specialized people. So that's really what we have in IT, right? So you've got people who specialize in storage and servers and all up the stack and everything from the facility. So you got, a, you know, heating and cooling in your data center and, and again, going back to the power, backup power, et cetera, right? There's a lot to take care of in order to run a really fully functional, fully stable uh, IT operation. So the, really the idea here is, and again, I'll blow this out quickly, is that the more of these boxes that you can remove from your responsibility, the more cycles you're gonna free up to focus on really what's truly important which is the end result for your end users, right? Your end user at the end of the day, or if you want to think of your end user as being your CEO or you know, whatever that might be, does not care really how you deliver the value to the business. They just want the value delivered to the business. You know, assuming you're following everything they need to follow, you know, he doesn't care if you bought Seagate drives or Western Digital doesn't even know those names of those companies, right? The really the value is in delivering the applications to the business, and the, not in what the different technology choices. Of course, they're important to IT professionals, but they're not important to the users. The users just want it to work. They want to get value out of it. And so if you're spending a lot of your time worrying about did I change out the UPS batteries last month or you know all of the different things in this stack, right? those are cycles being taken away from the more important thing, which is really delivering value at the top of the stack to the end users. So we're really talking about just driving down complexity 
in running your operation as much as possible. There's about 100 other slides that I could normally do here, but I'm keeping this short because I want to go to demo. So now you're going to wonder, okay, so why am I talking about Microsoft Azure? If you're convinced that the cloud has some value, you know, why the Microsoft cloud? It's actually, you know, Tommy, there was that OpenStack question earlier, which would be kind of the major competitor to Azure. I really see OpenStack actually as a competitor to Azure, not to VMware. VMware is not really cloud, you know, or barely. <laughs> so, the idea here is simply that if you're going to adopt another technology platform, if that's going to be cloud, the idea, or another cloud, if you're going to adopt a cloud, do you want to adopt a brand new technology platform or do you want to, uh, to adopt one that you can standardize across the three different places where you might want to put your workloads? The three places being at a service provider. So I, I work for Epic. I'm not here presenting on behalf of Epic. It's just kind of my personal presentation. But Epic has a cloud. Microsoft has, obviously has Azure. And then what about on-prem? So the idea is you don't want to add to complexity by having three different technologies in those three different places. You want to be able to do whatever you need to do and do it in the same way with the same technologies at the three locations. And the side thing to that too is potentially there's three different security threat vectors, right? If you have three different platforms and all three have, you know, potentially different security concerns. Whereas if you are standardized on one platform, that's a little easier to manage. So I'll skip over this and actually I added in this next slide. So you might be wondering when I said, sorry, I'm gonna go back one. So when I say service provider, I say customer on-prem and I say public cloud Azure. So the reason I really strongly believe in what Microsoft's done is they've really taken that hybrid approach to heart. They've said, assuming you believe in the value that cloud delivers, we understand that you're gonna to need to put that cloud, and it kind of doesn't make sense if you really think of what the cloud is, but you're gonna to need to access that cloud potentially in different places. Microsoft's not saying we're gonna build an Azure data center you know, in every city in the world, right? They'll never, they'll never do that. They'll cover off the major regions across the world, with that, which they have. There's two data centers in Canada, for example. There's four or five or six or something in the US now. The worldwide, we'll see a map of that when we log in. But maybe that doesn't even do it for you. Maybe you have a special workload that must be on-prem. You know, think of something uh, that you know, it's maybe needs to be military application. I don't know, like there's probably, you know, data sovereignty issues or more likely maybe it's a latency issue. You know, the data centers in Canada are in, in you know, Eastern Canada or Central Canada, I guess, technically Toronto and one in Quebec. So maybe there's a latency issue for you or a bandwidth issue or whatever it is. Well, you need to be able to get the stack where you need it or where you want it. So. You know, Epic has a stack here. So when I say that, I mean, literally, Azure stack. So you can literally get Azure in your own data center. You can now, these are actually, Cisco is another vendor now that's signed on. And, and it's interesting that Adam said, well, I don't want to have to, you know, put together a thousand pieces and spend six months building it. Like, it's literally what this is. If I want Azure and I want it on my prem, I order it from any one of these vendors or Cisco, it wheels in in a rack. You know, you configure it obviously to key on your network. It is the equivalent of public Azure on your prem. And this is what Epic has in our data center that's on Waverly. It's the same interface, it's the same APIs. You don't have to do anything different. There's slight differences because some services are only available in Azure. The, the ones that are made to like hyper, hyper scale obviously aren't gonna hyper, hyper scale on a, on a single rack. So there are some limitations, but that's the point, right? So if you think about it this way, and we're gonna do a deployment here in a second, and I'm gonna do it in public Azure, obviously, but I could do it on public Azure, build this thing out all out using public resources on Azure, and I go, okay, great, I got it all working. I download the template, I put it on my, into production, I spin up the exact same thing, right? I don't have to think about it if I did it in AW, in, you know, obviously the major competitor would be Amazon. I could do all the dev tests in the world I want on Amazon, but then, then what? I need to put it on-prem. 
You know, that's basically great. I've got a config that works on Amazon. Now what? It's got to be on-prem, right? It, it does very little good. Whereas in the, in the Microsoft model, I can put it in any place I want. It's the exact same um, interface technology, everything. I only need to learn one technology, not I've got to learn how to work with Amazon, then I still got to deal with my on-prem. You get the point. So in the demo, hopefully time permitting, this is a little bit ambitious, but we're gonna start by building uh, a load balancer. So we're gonna create an availability set, I don't know why I always struggle with that word, with Linux VMs in it uh, and add a load balancer to it. Uh, then we're gonna take it across the world. We're going to load balance, it's not really load balancing, it's traffic manage across the world. So we're gonna see how, it, how to do that. Uh, this is one we probably won't get to, but again, I think management, automation management and so on is important. So I was gonna domain join uh, the Linux VMs to a Windows domain controller also in Azure that's syncing to Azure Active Directory. Anyways, that's probably not as inter interesting to you guys. What, what, what is Windows DC? Uh, domain controller, <coughs> sorry. Right. I have a question about the Windows Domain Controller. Yes. Is that a standalone legacy DC running on VM? Or is that Azure Directory Services domain services? It's, so, <laughs> so it's a little bit of a cheat. Um, so it's a standalone Windows Server 2016 running Active Directory in a VM in Azure, but also syncing to Azure Domain Services, right? So normally it would be on-prem syncing to cloud uh, Azure, but I don't have an on-prem server, so I put it in you know, You'll see it in the diagram, actually. I could have answered it this way. So anyways, this is what it looks like. Step one, just I think it's easier to understand rather than bullets if I draw it out. Step one, spin up two VMs on a virtual network, they both, have, they will both have public IPs. That's my laptop at the top, in case you were wondering what the diagram was about. Didn't label that one. Uh, we'll put them in Central Canada for this. Uh, we'll open up the firewall rules for SSH and HTTP so we can hit each of these servers, verify they're working. Then we'll add a load balancer to it. And we'll show you that the load balancer will <coughs> fail over. Uh, it'll actually round robin route. Uh, between the two, but also detects if one's down, so it obviously doesn't send traffic to a machine that's down. So this would kind of be phase one, and I think we'll have time for this, so I won't make it as complicated, but we'll do it in another data center in another region, and right, we can pick any one you guys want. Uh, well, actually, to save time, if we have time, I'll spin up one in any other data center. I did already spin up a VM in Australia, and, and, and do that just because I think we might run it short on time, but if not, we'll do the whole thing but you, you'll watch a VM spin up here, so that'll just be a little bit redundant. Mm -hmm. um, then we'll add Traffic Manager to it. And so Traffic Manager is like a load balancer, but it's a little bit different. Um, it's not, it has other functionalities. So it can balance traffic based on, if I'm coming from a region, I'll direct my traffic to a region. So if I'm building out an infrastructure and I have it you know, redundant to Australia, and to North America, then I can sense, okay, if I'm getting traffic from Asia, I'll send it to Australia, not to just round robbing it, all, all this one goes to North America, this, whatever, and there's a bunch of different rules that you can use to do that with. Hmm. DNS based? And it's DNS based, so correct. So the failover times, it's not, uh, it's the failover times are longer. It's based on a DNS and a timeout, so it's like, I'll, I'll set it down 30 seconds just to make it a little quicker. Whereas the load balancer is much faster. Oh yeah. Enough slides, right? That's just sort of to set the table. Okay, so I've already logged into Azure here. So we're talking about the map. You can see there's a little status indicator here. Uh, those are all the data centers and green check marks. So there's no major issue going on at any data center right now. That's what it's showing you there. So this is the Azure portal. And we're just looking at the dashboard. So because I wanted to make sure we had things spun up and ready in case something went slightly array, awry in the demo. There's a few things I've created already. We'll recreate them, but I have ones built already to fall back on. But just so you understand, there's some things built already. So I just want to explain one concept, resource groups. So sorry, I have a tendency to click a little fast, but if you go into resource groups, which is this icon here. So before you create anything in the new portal in Azure, it needs to go into a resource group. So in the old classic portal, everything ended up 
on like the main page. So you might have 20 different business units and like, man, it's just like crazy to understand, like keep track of, does this interface go with this VM, blah, 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 right? Everything was in one pane. So now you can create resource groups. This is a much better way to organize things. So again, they're just logical groupings. You can name them whenever you want. They're really for your convenience, but they put things all into one, uh, into one group so that you can keep track of what's what. So pretty much you can ignore like the top one and the bottom here. So this, this is the one that I created that's in, in Australia. Um, this is the Linux VMs that I've, we're gonna recreate this one. Um, and then there's one with the, the, uh, the Windows domain controller in it already, because again, I figured you guys didn't really wanna watch me <laughs> configure a Windows domain controller. <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's go through this. So I'm gonna start, now again, you don't actually have to do it in this specific order, but I think it, it'll be a little bit more logical if I do it like this. I'm just gonna depend heavily on internet speed. So we create a resource group name. Now I've, I've, I've got some notes just in one note here, just to uh, make my, what did I put? Is this thing scrolling funny because of the screen size? Um, just so I don't have to type everything and make sure I don't forget any steps. So I'll just copy that name. So again, you saw that I had one called this already, so I'm just gonna call this O2. So I'm just creating basically an empty resource group here. And again, I can put it anywhere in any of the regions, so that's just a quick listing of the regions that are available. So we'll stick to Canada Central for this one. And I'll say create. So this only takes a second. It's doing nothing more than creating a logical group that'll be empty to start. So let me just refresh this. So here's the one I just created, right? So I've got a resource group here. And again, screen resolution, but there's nothing in it. You can see it's empty, no, no resources in here. So step one, I'll create an, what's called an availability set. So when I say hit the plus sign there, I can search and I will say avail, and it usually is pretty good at predicting what you want. Availability set, this is a product from Microsoft. This is kind of the store, I'm not gonna go into the details here, but there's all kinds of vendors that have put products in a Microsoft store which you can then pick or purchase uh, from the store, depending, some need to license, some don't. Um, so I'll pick the availability set here. Just give me a description of what it is on the right. I'll, I'll say create. Okay, it wants me to give it a name. So it really doesn't matter what I call it. This is really for my purposes. So I'll just say O2 because I have an O1 in the other one just to avoid confusion. And it's gonna ask, see, I could have created the resource group here if I wanted, but I just wanted to do it ahead of time. So I'm picking the existing resource group. I'm telling it where I want this availability set. I'm not gonna go into deep on this because it's a little bit complicated topic, but basically an availability set is so when you create more than one virtual machine, they don't end up in the same rack. And then let's say that rack is a power outage, then both of your redundant, so-called redundant machines would be out. Mm -hmm. So all the availability set does is ensure that next VM you create that's in that set is ensured to be in, a, in an infrastructure that's physically separate from the first one. And then the update domains is, under the covers, of course, this is all running virtualization. Those hosts, those bare metal hosts do have to be updated at times. So I might end up with all my VMs in two different racks, only two racks. So if this rack powers out, this one's still fully going because I have two availability sets. But then inside there, I also have update domains. So they won't, if I, I have five, I can stage the updates in here, right? So this one will update and reboot and then the next one in the rack, then the next one in the rack because they're in different update domains. I know it gets complicated, but that's the point is you don't want two machines out at the same time. That's what an availability set's all about. And to do use a load balancer, you must have them in an availability set, which is why we build the availability set first. You can actually create it when you're creating the VM, but I like to do it this way. It's just a little more logical. Okay, so you can see it's real quick here to create the availability set. We go back into the resource group, just so I can show you. So we have now an availability set that we just created in this resource group. So far, so good. So the next thing we wanna create are the VMs as per my notes. So when we create, uh, we'll use CentOS. So again, I search for it. This is the one, and so here's an example of a publisher that's not Microsoft, obviously. This is supported, however, by Microsoft, so I'll use this one. And again, it's just a description here, and if there was licensing terms, something like that, it might appear here. 
not important for this demo. Give it a name. So I'm going to call it a virtual machine, Linux. I like to give it, if I'm big, building a bunch of them, whoops, my mouse pad's making me scroll there, sorry. So, and I, because I already created some, I have a one and a two and a three already, I'm just going to start with uh, four for this, because I already have those ones. We can pick what type of machine we want it to be. I'm going to give it, uh, you cannot use root here, obviously, that's a restriction. And by the way, if you're creating a Windows VM, you also cannot use administrator or any of those really bad uh, security practices. It forces you to pick a unique uh, name here. And I'm going to use, oh, let's see if I can, I have putty gen somewhere just so I can grab my. You better keep it default. Yeah, where is it? Putty gen. No, I can't type what I'm signing up. Yeah, it's here somewhere. I had it open, but then, uh, hold on, let me just minimize. It's on my desktop. Oh, I don't have to do it with a key. I thought it was pinned down here. Sorry about the delay here. No. I really want to use a key, so bear with me just for one second. I have it, I believe, in here. All right, so sorry about that. So I just want to take this key here, which is just going to make my life easier later. Okay, so I give it a username, and then I give it my public key. I inadvertently gave you a putty gen demo there. It wasn't really supposed to be part of it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, I'm going to uh, use the existing resource group that I already did. I'm going to put it in Canada Central. And um, when I say OK here, now it's going to ask me for what size of a machine I want. So it goes out and fetches what's, so depending which region you've picked, not all machine sizes are available in all regions. Um, so that's why it takes a second to load there. And I can say view all, which I'm going to do, because for whatever reason, does, I think it, it's Microsoft suggesting the ones it has most available, not the ones that's best fit for you. I'm not sure, but anyhow, this is the one I want. So as you can see, it's a one core, three gig. You get the point. Jesus, this is expensive. You can see load balancing here. Yeah. You can, so yeah, I'll touch on that in a minute. But it's, again, like I said, this is real business focus. Yeah. And if you think about all the things in that stack, yeah. right, that's the reason. <laughs> um, there's a much cheaper machines, by the way. There's, there's ones as low as $25 and not available in all regions. You can scroll. You, you can get real expensive ones, too, as you can see, oh. right? <laughs> These are big honking machines, $1,200 a month. But keep in mind, the one thing I will say about the cost, so you're only charged when they're actually running, like when you shut them off. So for so obviously for a production environment, you know, they're always running, so that you're gonna pay the full bore. For dev tests, for example, what I'm doing here, I'm gonna spin these up, we're gonna have these running for maybe an hour, I'm gonna shut them off, they're gonna cost me like a dollar. Right? So really cheap for dev tests. Okay, so let's not worry about the storage account. This is, I'm gonna go over a couple of these fast. It's going to build an, actually, I'm going to pick an existing virtual network just on the off chance we do uh, want to join it to that, um, that domain later. So that, that Windows domain has a virtual network already. It exists. So I'm putting it on the same virtual network as the Windows domain controller. That's what's happening there. It's going to give me a public IP address to access it. It's going to create a new network security group. I do want to create a new network security group, but I don't want it to, I'm going to use it for more than one machine. So I'm just going to make it a more generic name. And it's gonna, uh, like, we're gonna come back to that, but it's got SSH open by default. That's what you're seeing there. High availability. So remember we made that availability set? This is where we pick it, right? Avail set two. So now this machine's gonna go into that availability set. And now I'm gonna say, okay. One last validation. If everything goes smooth, you'll see it's deploying this virtual machine. It's spinning the virtual machine up for us right now the one that we want to create. So behind the scenes, there's a lot of things that actually have to happen in the right order. It needs, and I don't know the exact order off the top of my head, but it's got to create an interface and then it's got an IP to it, then it's got to add the network to it, and then it's got blah, blah, blah. All these things have to happen in the right order. So you can do them all manually, right? But then the interface is nice. It just goes out and does it for you automatically. 
So while that one's spinning, we're going to need a second one. So I'm going to kind of just repeat the steps here. So John, is it actually local to the site that you're in, or is it distributed? It's local to the site. It has to be on the same virtual, like basically virtual network, which is within one location. It's not, yeah, it's not geographic. It's, it's within the site. Okay, so while that one's spinning up, we're just going to make another one here. Because we need two for this demo, it's going to be basically the exact same thing. So I'll go through it as fast as I can. Sent OS, uh, what did I go? Five. Five, right? Can you spin up more than one at the same time? As many, you can spin up hundreds at the same time if you have a need for that. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to be yeah. just looking at a count button somewhere or something. It, yeah, there's, oh, okay. there's PowerShell, there's okay. automation, there's all cool. kinds of things like that, yeah. Uh, and I'm making an availability set, which is really just for the redundancy piece. There's actually something else called a scale set, which is really the kind of the same idea. A scale set will actually automatically add more virtual machines within parameters that you set, but it's a little more involved to get going. Okay. <coughs> I don't want to create a new resource group. We're going to use this, the same one that we already just created. Uh, how, how does that same resource group separate the, the other different products? Not the resource group does it. The, it the availability the set does. does. Yeah. yeah. So you have different availability sets. Different. One availability set. Uh, they both go in the same availability set. That tells it to put anything in alternating racks, basically. The, 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 the set says that. Like, Correct. It's a rule, sort of. So yeah. the resource group says, I'm in Canada Central. And then I could have X number of availability sets within that resource group, each independently asserting affinity rules for that collection of VMs. Mm -hmm. So you, I don't know if you notice it pop up. Just correct. Sorry, Adam. I just it, it did create that VM is done while we were while we were uh, just talking there. The first one's finished. I'm just creating the second one here. So just a few. I mean, we'll we'll put it in a new storage count. We could put. It doesn't matter. This, these are details. <coughs> Again. We want to put them all in the same virtual network, so we'll pick the existing virtual network. Public IP address will be new. So remember I said I wanted to give that network security group a more generic name. That way I only have to change the rules once. So I'm going to pick the one that I just made. Oh, I made two of these with the same name just to make it confusing. I just realized. Um, so the other one's in the other resource group, so that's fine. Um, and then, again, pick the availability set. And that's what guarantees that those two machines will not be in the same rack or not be dependent on the same physical in infrastructure. Um, and I forgot to correct. Okay. Just a, a little bit of a tangent. That implies that in the Azure data centers, storage for the VMs is local to the rack containing the compute resource as well. Correct. Okay. Correct. And this is actually... I, just to sidetrack slightly, you'll notice the one thing that's unique about the whole Microsoft approach. There's no storage in here. Like, there's no, like, SAN type storage. All the storage is local storage on the machines. So it's just a big rack full of machines with local SSD storage <coughs> on every machine. It's a totally, uh, it's a very unique infrastructure that they built. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's a different than approach than you would take in most data centers. Like, they don't do SAN storage. Okay, so we'll just look at this. Again, this is the resource group. So you'll notice we're starting to get a few things in the... It's a little bit hard to see now because of the size of the screen. Storage but accounts. There's the storage for the VMs. There's the one VM. There's the interfaces. So it's building all these components out uh, while it's spinning up these virtual machines. So now we can connect to the first one we created. So if I click on this, this is first one 04. So here it's giving us details about what that machine's doing, including its public IP address, etc. You'll notice it does some graphing on CPU and network, uh, some, some you know basic reporting for every machine. Um, so here, just to vi we can now log into this. So I'll just copy this. I can click to copy just by clicking in the browser uh, and then I can just paste that into PuTTY. And I will log, so remember I gave it IMJ, and now it's using my public key, so now I'm logged into that machine that we just built, right? 
Um, so there's a couple steps here we need to do to get it ready for, I'll just sue the root. Um, so it's got no web server installed by default. So we'll get Apache going. Can't see the button on. Yes. I love how the different package managers on each platform are different default. Like half of them are yes and half of them are no. <laughs> you know, just to keep you guessing, you're always on your toes there. Um, and I just want to check my notes here real quick to make sure I don't forget any steps. Network security groups. You didn't do a security group. Yeah, the security group is where I did that that renaming. Well, NSG. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Network security group. Mm -hmm. Security group. Yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> Um, this is going to work without static IPs, and I'm not going to bother changing. It's just an extra step we don't have to do. So per distro, uh, we got to allow HTTP. I'll do that in a second. Um, uh, yeah, just my alias commands. Yeah, um, I came from SUSE, which is abandoned L as a default now, which really annoys me. So I'm just going to turn on HTTP. Oops. And let's just give it a default web page based on the host name. Okay, so if I go to the browser, and or. paste that, oops, oh, I forgot I copied and pasted. Go back and get the IP address. <clears throat> oops, in this tab here. So we should see a web server up and running. No, you won't, you didn't edit the security group yet. Oh. Thanks. After I said I was going to go back and do that right away. Right. God, thank guys. You guys are here. Otherwise, this would be really all over the place. Okay. So, sorry. We'll go into the Linux thing. Go into the availability set. Or, sorry, not the availability. The security group. Okay. So, you can see SSH was allowed by default. I'll just quickly go and create a new rule for HTTP. Say add over here. Allow HTTP. Any... I'll say HTTP and allow as the default. I'll say okay. It's adding that security rule now to that network, the security group that we. Does it open on both ports? What? Pardon me? Does it open on both ports? Open on both ports? You're yeah. asking about HTTPS? Yeah. Oh, the separate rule for separate each rule. each one's separate rule, yeah. I noticed there was a protocol there with HTTP. Is it doing like deep packet inspection and seeing whether I'm passing other traffic into that port, or is it just basically references to ports? As far as I understand there, it's only you saying HTTP and it's just uh, right. a shortcut to 80 as far okay. as I know. I don't think it's doing anything deep there. No, because that's an extra cost option. <laughs> no, I don't think it is even an option, but I will show you where it is. So this should be working now. Yeah, as your security gateway or something like that. Is it done? Yeah. It should be in the right one. Just double check it. I put the the uh, VM in the right group. That's in the interfaces. Come on. So it's supposed to say VM Linux CentOS 04? Yep. Yeah. You got it right here. Oh, there you go. Oh, so it's your browser. <laughs> oh, there. Yeah. Just took a second. So it pushes, like it's all automation, right? So it pushes the rules out to whatever the network controls are. So sometimes it does take a couple seconds to propagate. So yeah, we got 04 up and running. So we want to do those same exact steps on the other one so we can demonstrate the load balancer. And so, whoops, sorry. Go back here. Go to 05. Grab its IP address. Log in with SSH. Oops, I got a pseudo. Oops, and I missed the D. Just a curiosity, do, does Azure run a standard set of mirrors 
in their public clouds. So this ought to like this is a VM image that comes from that publisher. Yeah. Um, so whatever that publisher has put into the dis <coughs> distribution, like I don't know. Okay. I'm just wondering uh, in terms of like standard sent off as an example. Do they run like a standard set of mirrors locally? I mean obviously they run Windows updates there, but it, it uses um, whatever's on the, on the distro, like so there's a bunch of distros by different vendors, right? So who, whatever they've done, yeah. like Microsoft hasn't done it, yeah. the mirrors are whatever the distro uses for mirrors typically. Okay. So if they're smart, yes, they've got their own set. Yeah, but Microsoft, like Amazon hosts specific word, like DigitalOcean hosts specific. Or oh, hosting mirrors. mirrors. Yeah. Just like for this, that purpose? Because they don't cut down the bandwidth cost, right? Not that I'm aware of, okay. but. No, uh, Roleplay. Who provides the end? Probably has it on the ground. Oh, awesome. Like mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that speaks to what you were saying. Yeah. You just and this one. Here, I'll just copy this. So much as is it local to the data center? <laughs> Which actually does make a difference because Everybody's. outside data center is more expensive than inside data center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, can make this different color. Just for the heck of it. Let's see, I'm gonna check. Oh, I don't use. Which is that the way you do it? On. On, right? <laughs> Service. I'm used to uh, OpenCC, which is not check and pay. All right, so that's got that web server up and running. Now it should be in the next same network security group, so it shouldn't. We shouldn't have to do any messing around there. And uh, yeah, so hit that IP. Yeah, okay, so 05. So we got both of them up and running. So we're at. Well, I won't go back to the slide, I guess, but we're at the fa. <laughs> There's a lot of building there. So we have the VMs, VMs up and running. We tested them on their public IPs, but we don't have it load balanced right now. They're just separate machines we're hitting. So we'll go back now and do the load balancer. Um, so roughly the same process. So we just say add new, search for load, oops, load, marketplace. I don't care about the marketplace unless it doesn't come up with my load balancer. I've never had that error before, of course. <laughs> Oh, it's just a momentary. No, nope. let's reload. And maybe I'll drill down into the resource group just to take one step out of it. So you can see I get a credit, um, and then I spin all my machines down. It saves a lot, saves the money because it's just all demo load balancer. Okay, so again, load balancer, you just want to check, make sure you got the right one. You want the Microsoft load balancer, at least if this is what your intention is, to replicate this. So LBO2, it doesn't really matter what I name it, as long as I don't press on my mouse pad while I'm typing. Uh, again, you can choose a public IP address. I don't need to for this demo. I'll just stick it in the existing resource group again. Again, it has to be Central Canada. Uh, Sorry, create new, I have to say. My bad. Uh, I can say, you know, whatever. I, let's say L, load balancer, IP. I'm going to say O2 because I probably have another one on the other one. And you can ask for a static IP or a dynamic. The difference is a slightly higher price for the, for the static. And also, when you spin down your VMs, since it doesn't... Oh, replace the bulb. <laughs> <laughs> When you spin down your VMs, you still get charged for the IP all the time because it's actually still allocated. Um, Central Canada, okay, so create the load balancer. All right, deployment in progress. That's for the, it should be for the load balancer even though it's still showing me. It's cost for static versus the dynamic. Oh, it's like a minor difference. Like really, it's not even important. <laughs> I don't know the exact price of it and it actually varies by region. Um, but yeah, like super in Africa, fine. they got lots. In North America, <laughs> not so much. Yeah. yeah. Strangely, no one has your regions in Africa yet. Yeah. Okay, so here's the load balancer. So I've just gone back into the resource group here, looking at all my different things in here, including the VMs and all that kind of stuff. So here's that load balancer I just created. So we created it, but we've got to configure it now. So um, you can set up pools on the front end. 
you don't need to. Uh, in this demo, I'm not going to, but that would, it's sort of weird. But anyways, that it's just it's just showing it's got that public IP that we just asked for. So the backend pool now we've got to add in. Okay, what machines do we want in the backend pool? So this doesn't matter what you call it here. Uh, we'll just call it pool two or three or whatever. Again, doesn't matter. Now this is where we associate it to something. So remember we created an availability set, all right? And now, sorry, so we created an availability set. Now which one do we want to assign it to? So we really only have the one, but inside that availability set are the two virtual machines that are in there. Um, oh, sorry, this is the, because I have one already. So this is the one we just created, avail set 02 with two virtual machines in it. Now I pick, now I add the machines and their interfaces. So we have CentOS 4, remember we created, and it only has one internal IP, so obviously that's what we pick. Well now we want to add the other CentOS machine that we made, and of course it only has one IP address as well, and then we say okay. I'm assuming the load balancer tracks changes to that ID if, if and when. It Correct, changes. it's bound by the name, which is why it didn't matter that I picked a dynamic IP because it's bound to the IP, the name we gave it, not to the actual IP. So if I spin this all down tonight and I spin it all up tomorrow, it does, rebinds to everything the way it is, which is why I don't care about it being a, a public IP. So the only part of this process, this is slow in the interface. It's actually, and I'm not gonna do the PowerShell, but uh, I can create, and this is of course difficult to see, but you, you can name all of this in variables in PowerShell and then create the, the load balancer through the script. And it's actually a little bit faster because I have to do things in a specific order and I can't do the next step till the next till the first one completes. So it kind of get, goes a little slow here. It's a little bit uh, frustrating. And I literally need to wait for this as it, so it's creating it. So, but the step after this, so you see the number increase there. I don't know if you noticed it, but it went from one virtual machine to two. So it's actually going out and modifying settings on the VMs, which is why this takes a little while. And then when that's done, we're gonna tell it how uh, to figure out whether or not those machines are alive. So we're gonna tell it to probe by HTTP on each of those two web servers. And so it can uh, figure out whether they're alive. Okay, so it's done. Doesn't take all that long, but it seems like an eternity in a demo. <laughs> okay, so we don't have any health probes, so we want to add a, a probe. So just whatever, health probe 02, 03, I keep typing wrong. So here's where we can specify a protocol. So I'm going to say 80, and it's going to check every five seconds, and uh, if it gets two bad results, it's going to flag that one as down so it won't route traffic to it. It's really that simple. The difference here between HTTP and TCP is TCP, if it gets the connection on port 80, no matter what happens, it's considered alive. HTTP, it has to get a 200 as the result. So it's actually good if you accidentally delete your main web page or something like that, right? It won't route traffic to it. Mm -hmm. So we'll use HTTP. So again, unfortunately, this is a step where I have to wait for it to complete until we can do the one last thing we need to do for this load balancer. Can you define different types of probes? Um, yeah, you can, no, you can define different ports in different TCP, but it's pretty limited. It's basically what you saw there. It's not, you know, it's not going to test if SSH is up, as an example, it's not one of them, or at least I don't think it is. And of course, if you need. Okay, that one doesn't take as long. Systems? Correct. Five will have to be solid compliance thrown in Azure. Correct, yeah. that is right. <laughs> <laughs> That's if you go search load balancing, you'll see all the ones in the marketplace. There's all kinds of other solutions, but this is sort of basic. So we need a load balancing rule now. It'll be rule 02. So we're gonna distribute the traffic 80 to back end, front end port 80 to back end port 80, you know, so we couldn't add it here if we needed to, um, between the two on the back end pool. And it uses this rule if the probe is valid um, and then you can set session persistence here, which you can see the timeout. So if it t sees a browser from here, it sends it to machine one, it will continue to send that browser to that machine until at least this timeout. 
uh, which is useful for applications that maybe don't track state between the two machines. I'm gonna leave it disabled in this. And actually by default it does it really anyways. Like it will seems to send it to the same machine even without setting that. Uh, but there's more of a guarantee obviously if you set it to, to respect the state. So this user goes to that machine, he's gonna continue to hit the same machine until the time of. So I do need to wait for this to finish. And again, there might be a slight delay even when it says it finishes. I will go to the overview. Let's get the, yeah, it says it's done. So it may take a second, but that should be hitting one of those machines now. Yay! Mm -hmm. So you see we have four up and we have five up. So let's just prove that this actually works. So let's go shut off four. Is this one four or is this one four? Right, so, so I'll shut off Apache on four. So if I go back, so this is again on its direct IP, you can see now it's gonna spin. If I go here and refresh this, Five. <laughs> so you can, I mean, I hope you kind of get a grasp for the point. Like, you want to do dev tests, you want to set things up quickly. It doesn't cost a lot of money to go in, spin up some machines, do some pretty complicated things. If you think about, you know, the if you're trying to do this for a larger organization while you have project plans and budget and, you know, think how long it takes to spin up two machines you know, with a load balancer and all that kind of stuff, but with an on-prem environment, it's, it's, you're not as agile, right? So this might, at the end of the day, cost more. I, I would say it probably doesn't if you take into account all of the things on that big stack that you have to pay for to get a class tier three data center to this level, this redundancy, whatever. I have a feeling this is probably a lot less expensive um, and it's certainly a lot more agile. And now I've got this built. I'll just show you one thing really quick. Uh, hopefully it's quick. So you can go in, and it's hard to find in the screen size. Um, let's go, let me close this. So just to give you a little feel for it. So there's an automation script uh, here. And so here is a JSON template, very long, but that would recreate, you can take that template now and put it in your public, uh, sorry, your private on-prem Azure, whatever you want, it'll recreate the exact same thing. There's actually, you know, the CLI script to do the same thing and a PowerShell, it gives you all of that. Some of these require changing. Um, you just see bash scripting to do this? Uh, well, you can get the CLI in uh, on Linux, right? Ooh. You can get the Azure CLI is available for Linux and PowerShell is available for Linux too. Not, you know, it might not be that intuitive that That's it's available, but. Not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, the, the number one thing that drives me insane about PowerShell is the tab completion is totally useless. I just cannot <laughs> adapt. I just like I'm lost. But I will say, the more I learn about PowerShell, it is amazing. Like everything goes into objects. And, anyways, we won't get into a PowerShell debate, which I will obviously lose in this room. But <laughs> <laughs> but it's better than you think. That's all I have to say about it. Okay, so. <laughs> yeah, it's just so hard to use. <laughs> um, but anyways, the point is automation, right? Making, be able to replicate this, take it wherever you want. Okay, so you, you, you probably, what time is it? Like how, do we want to try the global uh, traffic manager? It doesn't actually take that long, so I'll, I'm not even going to wait for an answer. <laughs> <laughs> so again, same, pro, same process, traffic manager profile is what it's called. Oh, there is a step I forgot. But again, take the Microsoft traffic manager profile, say create. Love how everything you've typed in has come back with a Fortigate hit of some sort. <laughs> uh, oh, two. Aggressive search key marketing. Use existing. Australia, remember we were putting that, this one. Oh, I'm going to put it in Australia. I don't have to for this, but I'm just going Does to. It doesn't. I, I was going to say, it really doesn't. Oh, and I picked the wrong. I don't want it on performance. Anyhow. I'll have to go back and edit that. So just from backstepping one thing, just keep in mind, I created this Australia VM already just so we didn't have to go through it here. So that's already created. And uh, I just need to start it, actually. 
So I got a quick question. Yeah. Like for the traffic matter here, say like it's spun up somewhere like in Australia, mm -hmm. but the user is from Brazil. And say you got another server in Brazil too as well. Does it yeah. have to go all the way to Australia? Then to get routed back to that router, like that server in Brazil? So the traffic that work? So uh, it, it really doesn't matter where the traffic manager is. It's really just a config and it actually utilizes DNS to do the load bouncing. So once, you know, the DNS server might be hosted in Australia, but I mean, after the first lookup, right, the, okay. the DNS is whatever it is. So for the traffic manager, it really doesn't matter. As far as I understand, there's really no reason why it can't be anywhere. Um, I just want to go in. So you see I have this one, 03. It's not running right now, and it's in the Australia East. So I'm just going to click on this and start it to just to get that VM up and running. Um, the one thing we need to go and do, I have to back up just a little bit. I apologize for jumping around. But I was just explaining that the traffic manager needs DNS to work. We didn't assign a DNS uh, value to the IP for the load balancer. Um, so let's just go back and do that. This is so much more difficult to navigate on a small screen, I tell you. So here's the load balancer again. It's got a public IP address, which I can also configure. Wait, I might have done this wrong. Ah, crap. Sorry, guys. Source group. I need the load balancer IP, not the load balancer. Here it is. Yeah, it has no DNS name, um, and I need to configure it. So DNS name, so whatever, mug demo. And it has a big long name. I'm assuming you can do your own DNS as long as it's hosted by yeah. DNS. It's gotta be unique in this. Yeah. Right, so this is, when as soon as I tap out of it, it does a validation, gives me a check mark saying, okay, that's fine, you can use that one. And uh, so I'll just save it. And then again, it's dynamic. All right, so that's all I needed to do there. And it just takes a few seconds for that to propagate as well. Did I have it here? No. Sorry for jumping around so much. Sometimes forget where you go to copy and paste stuff. <coughs> so here's the DNS name we gave, so I can copy this. And in theory, if that's propagated, I can now hit that. So you see that DNS working. I just wanted to check that before we went to the next step. Okay, so I already gave one to the uh, <coughs> to the Australian one just to save time. So <coughs> let's go back in to the Australian resource group. Let's find that. Um, traffic manager that I just created because we now need to <coughs> configure it. So configuration. So we don't want performance. We want priority. I'm going to change the default the lowest it can go is 30 seconds. And that's the way it's going to route. I'm going to save that. Where, where, where is this portal as your Who's running this? Where is this from? Portal.azure. That's the main, like, like that's Microsoft Public Azure. So, so basically, you don't know where it's running. Will it be redirected to where? I'm guessing it probably uses this traffic manager to, to, figure to out route you to your, uh, you know, to the nearest uh, portal. Probably in Canada someplace. I'm guessing, yeah, but I actually have no idea where the actual portal runs out of. Uh, to start with, you have a map of all the Azure services across the world. Yeah, Azure sites. Azure data centers for one way of looking. So I, in this example, we're going to use public IP address as the target resource type. And then we will choose the load balancer public IP. So is that right? Yeah, priority one. And then we want to add... Uh, I probably named that wrong because I was talking, but end02, we'll just call it again, cloud, public IP. The Australian one? 
Yeah. And this, it must be. Okay, so nothing would change. Uh, so here's its DNS name. So it's good. I feel like I missed a step there. We'll see if this works. Not referring to my notes. Okay, so it's so now instead of okay, I should have went yay on that one, but anyways. <laughs> Okay, before we were hitting the load balancer, which was sending us to the Canadian data center. Now we're hitting the traffic manager, which is sending us to both Australia and Canada. It's still sending us to CentOS 05 because that one's running and it's the higher priority one. So now if we were to take the 05 VM and shut it down like we did for 04. Uh, service, stop. <coughs> Now this takes a little longer to fail over. So again, this is not designed for, for high, like super high availability failover, right? This is it's going to take longer because it's DNS. It's still spinning. So let's take a minute. I just want to first thing, and while we're just waiting for that to happen, I'll just double check and make sure that other VM that we were spinning up was actually up and reachable, the Australian one. It was this one, and let's just take its public IP. So three. It's something I, I feel strongly I missed something. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Does the traffic manager need some kind of a check, like a health check? It does do a health check. Let's go back. To Australia. Status online, online. Yeah, it just it doesn't have to help check on the things it's online. Check your notes. <laughs> yeah. I think I might need to. So if this works, then that traffic manager should. Yeah, so it's up on the DNS. There it is. So again, it's DNS based failover, so it just does take a little bit of time sometimes. So the, if you're wondering, so the way you would build it is you would build an availability set both in Canada and in Australia, so that way you would have quick failover to, no matter what, and then your traffic, again, you can route traffic based on source or on all kinds of different rules. I just pick priority. So it does Canada first, and if that's not working, it goes to Australia. So at the end of the day, we created what's on this slide. We won't do the domain joining part. So I'll just again build this out. We created the virtual machines. We built the virtual network, set up the web servers, connected to them on their public IP. We had a load balancer. We did the exact same thing in Australia. Then we had a traffic manager that runs traffic to the load balancer in Canada, which picks between these two machines, whatever's up. Or if that's all down, it routes to Australia and picks the web server there. So that's it for the demo. So questions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty easy to set up infrastructure, like I say. It's awesome, like if you want to test something on, on you know, any, any, even like Linux, like I spin up machines all the time in there, oh, I want to test out this config or test out this new, in theory you could image your machines and upload them to Azure and test patching on them, uh, all kinds of things. And I didn't, uh, we scratched the surface, you can add full automation. Uh, there's a thing called, uh, well, so if you know what System Center is, but it'll patch your Linux machines for you on a schedule, it'll patch, you know, do all your upgrades, 
the, the goal is to get to as much automation as possible, right? So you're not having to touch every single machine. You can also build your own images, custom to yourself when you spin them up, use your own image. Uh, pretty much you name it. I mean, it's really designed for enterprise scale, enterprise level automation, uh, those kinds of things. I think you can get $25. Everyone can sign up for a free Azure, just go to portal. You get 25 bucks to play with and you can spin up some machines and replicate what I did here and uh, play with it yourself if you want. All right. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you.